Well, everyone, in a completely unexpected turn of events, uh, this morning it was announced that Amber Heard has officially fired Elaine and has replaced her counsel with somebody else on appeal. These two gentlemen that were named in particular are David Axelrod and J. Ward Brown. We were going to touch upon that in just a moment. But first, I want to show you guys the announcement. Amber Heard hires new appellate counsel, renowned First Amendment attorneys David L. Exelrod, not to be confused with David M. Exelrod. He used to be a, um assistant to the president at some point. Uh, and J. Ward Brown of Ballard Spar will lead the appeal to overturn the jury verdict. On August 15th, that's today, this morning at 9 a.m., in Washington, Amber Heard has hired Ballard Spar, that's the firm where the two attorneys work, as her lead appellate counsel in preparation for filing to appeal the June 1st, 2022 defamation trial verdict. Led by Mr. Axelrod and Mr. Brown, the pair successfully defended the New York Times against Sarah Palin's defamation lawsuit earlier this year, which was Palin v. New York, uh, the decision that came down uh, earlier this year in February. Uh, Jay has been representing journalists, news organizations, documentary filmmakers, and other speakers in First Amendment cases for 30 years. David is a former federal prosecutor and first chair trial lawyer who represents companies and individuals in high stakes civil litigation. Quote, we welcome the opportunity to represent Ms. Heard in this appeal as it is a case with important First Amendment implications for every American said David Axelrod and J. Ward Brown in a joint statement. We're confident the appellate court will apply the law properly without deference to popularity, reverse the judgment against Ms. Heard, and reaffirm the fundamental principles of free speech. Wow. Let's just talk about that very briefly. Um, so free speech is permitted, right? This is a free country, the First Amendment, literally and in our constitution, right? In the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights, the right to free speech. It's got five parts to it, but one of them is, and I believe actually the first one, the right to free speech. This is literally the foundation that this country was founded upon, right? However, you are not permitted to say things about another that are not true and defamatory, you know, damaging a person's reputation. Um, in this trial, I think it was pretty obvious and the jury found that uh, they did not believe Amber, they believed Johnny, and therefore Amber lost, Johnny won. The only way she understands that she can beat this case is by actually litigating it from the side, right? So she can't litigate the case on the facts because if she appeals on pure defamation claims that my statement was true, Johnny's was false, or Johnny's was uh, uh, not true, mine was true, but however you want to phrase it, she knows that she's going to lose. The only way that she has hope in this case is going on freedom of speech grounds. And this is why she hired this firm. Now, we're going to take a, a deep dive into this firm in just a moment. Uh, ben Rottenborn, by the way, is staying on the team. Ben Rottenborn of Woods Rogers uh, Van Deventer Black will continue to represent her as co-counsel, while Elaine Charleston Bredehoft of Bredehoft Cohen Brown and Nadelhaft is stepping down. This is the perfect time to pass the baton, said Elaine Charleston Bredehoft, as the judge probably asked to turn on her mic. I have pledged, <laughs> I'd love that. She just pledged, she never actually provided, but simply pledged to Amber and her appellate team, my complete cooperation and assistance as they move forward on the path towards success. So they can't win with me. Uh, the path of success lies without me, Elaine. Uh, and so she's stepping down. Okay. Uh, now, about Ballard and Spar, this is all part of the same um, uh, press release. Ballard Spar, an 
American Law 100 law firm with more than 600 lawyers in 15 U.S. offices, serves clients across industry sectors in litigation, transaction, regulatory compliance, blah, blah, blah. This is who we are. I mean, strategic counsel, powerful advocacy. They got these, these pepper words. So let's, you know, rather than just going off of what they have to say, let's take a look at what they're actually about. Okay, so first and foremost, I think it would be most behoove us to find our protagonist, uh, the new leader of Amber Heard's appellate team, Mr. David Axelrod. Okay, Mr. David Axelrod, who is he? Um, sorry, that's the wrong tab. Give me just a moment. Um, who is he? Right. So I went to the website. I went to the website to find out who he is and what he's about. All right, so that's David, Mr. Axelrod. He's a partner at Ballard Spar. Um, they have phones in Philadelphia and New York, but as you will see, uh, the firm, I believe, is based in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, but they, they, the, the central nervous system of the operation. Because like I said, uh, they have 15 offices all across the country, so I'm I'm not entirely sure where the, the nerve system uh, the brains of the operation really is. But David Axelrod, when I started reading this, I was very confused. Uh, let me explain what I mean. This is what Ballard Spar, this is their website. This is what they have to say about Mr. Axelrod. David Axelrod is a first chair trial lawyer who specializes in defending corporations and individuals in government facing litigation involving, there it is, the United States Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice securities fraud. This is what David has been doing for years. Okay. If you look on his uh, LinkedIn page, by the way, on LinkedIn, you can see that David has been um, pretty much doing this exclusively for at least the last 15 years. 14, 15 years. He started as a United States attorney with the United States Attorney's Office, moved on to the regional, as regional trial counsel for the US SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then he became a partner in profile, partner and practice leader of Securities Enforcement and Corporate Governance Litigation Group. All right. So that's who he is. This is who she hired, right? No, wait. There's more. So let's look at David real quick. All right, let's take a, a closer look at David. He's also been defending parties sued for defamation. So he does have a bit of experience. Um, I believe Mr. Brown is the one with uh, the heavier experience in this duo. That's why they're tag teaming it and he's not doing it by himself. Uh, David has tried more than 20 federal cases to judgment and has secured favorable jury and bench verdicts in high-profile trials under intense media and public scrutiny. He has extensive experience arguing cases on appeal. David has success. This is probably where he comes in. David has successfully designed and executed courtroom strategy in a wide range of cases, both civil and criminal. So let's take a look at his cohort real quick before we come back to David. Let's take a look at Mr. Brown. Jay Brown has been representing news and entertainment companies for three decades. So he's the entertainment nerve center of this duo. They both bring something different to the table for Amber, right? Mr. Brown has the experience in defamation, has been representing entertainment companies, has been in the media. Mr. Uh, Axelrod has experience on appeal, has done a little bit of defamation, mostly securities fraud, but with Mr. Brown's knowledge and his own appellate experience, Axelrod's experience, together they form the duo that Amber needs. That's why they're both named. They had a joint statement. They're not, they're, they're going to be tag teaming this, okay? They both bring something that Amber needs to the table. There's not one lawyer that can do this. So that's why Elaine is being replaced by a duo rather than a single individual. Whatever she's trying to accomplish, Ballard Spar has to offer, but not in a singular sense. 
And also that means double the legal fees. By the way, people have been asking how is she paying for it? I suspect, I don't have confirmation of this, but just based on the data that we have received so far, um, it, she just recently sold her home, which I think was in Arizona. I believe the proceeds from that home are being used to pay for these uh, people, for these lawyers, their uh, representation. So what has he done? He has litigated defamation. There it is. Privacy, copyright, subpoena, and access matters in the U.S. Supreme Court, federal, and state appellate court and trial courts across the country. By the way, this is the same firm that remember when they um, during the trial when Morgan Tremaine from TMZ was getting ready to testify and moments before he took the stand, there was an emergency interlocutory, which just means interjecting in the middle, interlocutory motion to prohibit him from taking the stand and testifying. That was this firm. This firm was hired to file that motion, argue that motion um, and by TMZ, and they lost. Granted, that was a much, much more different issue. It's one of those things that, you know, you just get hired and you don't you don't know what what the result is going to be. So I know some people are probably going to be dinging them points. You know, you lost on one motion during the trial. I get that. But speaking as an attorney, you have this is literally this is not even apples and oranges. This is not even Venus and Mars. This is like this is like. Two completely different things. I don't know. I can't think of an analogy that is so stark at this moment to, to explain to you all um, how different is it to argue one motion in one trial regarding one witness's testimony and the judge saying no versus an entire appeal that is going to be based on First Amendment principles. Um, very, very difficult to compare. You can't, you can't call them losers just because they lost that one motion and you know, the uh, Camille and Ben are going to have a field day with these guys. Absolutely not. This firm, by, based on my research and what you're about to find out, as we're going to go even deeper into this um, analysis of the firm, you will realize that they are a force to be reckoned with. Um, now, how strong is their argument? We'll get to it at the very end. Um, but let's look at them closely, right? So Jay also regularly serves as clearance counsel for producers of documentary films and series, including Oscar, Emmy, and DuPont Columbia award-winning productions, and provides legal vetting of stories for newspaper and magazine publishers at all. I mean, it looks like he is he's a Hollywood staple. He gets hired on these um, cases where there is a First Amendment issue, right? When there is a First Amendment issue, Jay Brown looks like he is front and center. He has been described by Chambers USA as, by the way, I, I don't know if this is a paid organization. Uh, you guys are welcome to do uh, the research on that. It, I, there are some that will give you awards like Super Lawyers, for example, um, a few others. You don't need to pay anything. You just get the, the recognition because of what your peers, your fellow attorneys are saying about you. I don't know if Chambers USA is one of those pay-to-play organizations, but you're welcome to look at it. They call him as, quote, a lawyer who delivers continuously high-quality service, possesses impeccable analysis and impressive writing skills, and has a, quote, friendly, approachable, attentive demeanor that sees clients wanting to, to use him exclusively. For a number of years, Jay served as a national defamation counsel to the NAACP. So um, to me, that's pretty big. If he was working with such a large organization, he was privileged to accept the NAACP's Civil Rights Champion Award for outstanding pro bono he was working for free and commitment to advancing civil rights and social justice. So this guy, like I said, he is no joke. Amber is going for big guns. She's going for some of the maybe most powerful First Amendment counsel in the nation. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that is actually who they end up being. Um, she's spending the last of her dollars trying to win this appeal, I, I imagine. As a public television journalist before law school, Jay produced or wrote many of the late Fred W. Friendly's award-winning programs, 
uh, on the Constitution, the press, the law, and ethics. And in 07, Jay took a three-year leave from the practice to help Hiscox, a Lloyd's of London insurance syndicate, uh, open its U.S. claims operation. Uh, he headed the company's North American media claims until he returned to his law practice in 2010. Jay was one of the founding attorneys of the highly regarded First Amendment boutique law firm Levine Sullivan Koch and Schultz in 97, which merged with Ballard Spar in October of 2017. So just shy of five years ago. Um, he successfully, now this is the big one. This is the big one. Uh, if this is what, I, oh, maybe it's a different one. Sorry, let me take that back. Uh, he successfully defended the New York Times in an action bought by a prominent cancer researcher. This is not it. I thought they were, because uh, uh, what's her name? Sarah Palin. Yeah, remember her? The, this firm, I don't know if it was this attorney in particular. Probably not. It, it may have been like at the top of the list because this is recent. This was in February. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but anyway, he represented the New York Times, which is a newspaper, uh, in an action brought by a prominent cancer researcher who headed a department at a major university and who claimed that a news report about alleged problems with research papers, the author or co-author defamed him. So he sued a newspaper for defamation and the district court granted the Times' motion to dismiss the complaint uh, and the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals confirmed. Jay argued for the Times in both courts. So a new, there's a common thread here, all right? There's a common theme you'll see. The New York Times... Um, uh, uh, comes up several times. He successfully defended Netflix, Apple, Amazon, companies, 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 newspapers, companies. Uh, I don't know how much experience uh, the firm has in litigating First Amendment claims between public individuals because Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are both singular people. They're not part of an entity, if you will, like the New York Times is a newspaper, you know, Netflix is a company, Apple is a company, Amazon is a company. These are copyright infringement actions that um, they, uh, they were successful in defending, right? Winning their cases. He defended CBS, a network in defamation action arising from a news report on its uh, New York television station about a federal raid on an adult entertainment club in New York. Um, again, Chicago television station from uh, obtained an order denying city of Chicago's emergency application to prevent Chicago television station WBBM CBS2 from broadcasting on the evening news a report about allegations of police misconduct. Um, twice successfully defended former New York governor. Right. We finally have our first individual twice successfully defended former New York governor Elliot Spitzer against claims for defamation. By the way, we're still talking about Mr. Brown. This is all Mr. Brown's work. This is him in the flesh, not just the firm. This is his personal accolades, his personal achievements. Right. Um, he defended him against claims of defamation, most recently in a suit filed in New York state court by former AIG CEO, which is a former insurance company, Hank Greenberg, based on comments Spitzer made during a television interview. So Spitzer made certain comments, got sued for defamation. Mr. Brown was able to successfully defend him. Uh, and in a book about proceedings uh, brought against AIG when he was attorney general, after the trial court dismissed many of the claims on Spitzer's preliminary motion, Spitzer was granted summary judgment on the remaining claims. So basically they one with flying colors successfully defended Washington city paper. Here we go back to papers uh, in the defamation action filed by Washington Redskins owner, Daniel Snyder over a profile titled the cranky Redskins fans guide to Dan Snyder after city paper filed its motion to dismiss invoking the district of Columbia's then brand new anti-slap statute. Snyder voluntarily decided to dismiss the lawsuit. He served as lead counsel for a coalition of national news again, news organization. So far, we got one individual that successfully moved and a pretty notorious one, right? So it's a, a celebrity in his own right, former governor, I think qualifies as a quote unquote celebrity, if not a public figure, at the very least, a public figure moved several times to intervene and to obtain access to the proceedings and record uh, during the first September 11th related criminal prosecution. Among other successes, Jay persuaded the Fourth Circuit 
to issue a writ of mandamus ordering the trial judge to provide same day access to trial exhibits. Uh, served as lead counsel for Clear Channel Communications. Uh, that's a communications um, broadcasting uh, company. And it's sports journalist Paul Feinbaum in the Alaba Supreme Court in a defamation action bought, brought by another sports broadcaster who claimed that Feinbaum had on air implied he was a homosexual. After Jay first persuaded the Supreme Court to reverse its initial refusal to hear an interlocutory appeal, the court reversed on the merits and rendered judgment for Feinbaum. Okay, another victory. Uh, with his colleague Lee Levine, he successfully represented the media defendants in Bartnicki versus Vopper, a landmark United States Supreme Court case arising out of the radio broadcast of a tape recording of a cell phone conversation between two teachers' union officials. Um the Supreme Court held the dismissal of the plaintiff's claim under the Federal Wiretap Act and reaffirmed the principle that the press cannot be held liable for publishing truthful information about a matter of public concern absent a governmental interest of the highest order, at least where it's played no role in the source's unlawful acquisition of the information. Whew, that's a mouthful, right? So... Um, that's that's uh, that's quite a repertoire. I mean, listen, I, I, I can't I can't hate on the guy. He knows his shit. All right. He knows his stuff. Um, you can go on their website. You can see some of his other accomplishments if you're interested. We're not going to go through every single one. Um, by the way, he graduated from the New York City School of Law. Uh, excuse me, New York University School of Law, cum laude. So guy was also very book smart, which is not surprising. Um, 1992. So he's been practicing 30 years. Uh, and he's obviously, uh, admitted to practice in many, many places. So let's go back to Mr. Axel, right? So now that we know the, uh, Mr. Brown, who's probably going to be the star of the show, at least from a legal perspective, I imagine that Mr. Axelrod is going to be the face, right? Because he's the, uh, well, I, I, I say that just because he's, he's an SEC guy, right? Why is he tag teaming this? So uh, he's done cases involving criminal and regulatory enforcement. He has broad experience in cases alleging securities fraud, stock, market manipulation, insider trading, accounting fraud, bank fraud, tax evasion, public corruption. In private civil litigation, David has secured significant victories in a broad range of cases from securities fraud to contracts and boom, defamation. See, defamation is kind of like a, it's a by the way, it's a, it's an also, it's a yes, I have done that as well, by the way, you know, it's not the center for Mr. Brown. It's front and center, right? Brown is like media corporations, uh, anything to do with newspapers, um, any of anything of that nature, broadcast services, right? This guy is, a, it's a, by the way, so he's a, I'm not going to read it. This is mostly, again, it's all about securities fraud, securities related disputes is what he has been doing. You know, he's represented investment advisors, investors, fund managers, broke dealers. So this guy is coming out of left field with this. Uh, under his services tab, it even says litigation, white collar defense, internal investigations, securities enforcement and corporate governance litigation, environmental, social and governance and crisis management. Maybe that's where he comes in. Right. Crisis management. Um, but here's the doozy. Right. Remember, I said that um, the this firm has represented Sarah Palin, oh, excuse me, the New York Times in the case of Sarah Palin versus New York Times. Well, Sarah Palin lost, right? Uh, I don't know if you all saw the article. This is a, this was from a few months ago. It was about six months ago, actually, I think to the day, right? Today's August 15th. So the jury, uh, of, yeah, almost to the day, February 16th of 2022, it was a, it was a jury trial. Uh, the jury rejected Sarah Palin's libel claim against the New York Times. Now listen to this. This is very important. Former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin lost her libel suit against the New York Times, represented by the firm we were just talking about, the firm hired by Amber Heard, right? Ballard Spar. It was representing the New York Times. Um, 
On Tuesday, when a jury rejected her claim that the newspaper maliciously damaged her reputation, again, remember, malice is a must because Sarah Palin is a public figure, maliciously damaged her reputation by erroneously linking her campaign rhetoric to a mass shooting. Um, I don't remember the exact article, but essentially what the main takeaway, we don't care about the, the real details here. You'll see what I mean and why. But what we care about is we have the New York Times being sued by Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin is suing for defamation. New York Times is being represented by Ballard Spar. New York Times wins. A judge has already declared that if a jury sided with Palin, he would set aside its verdict on the grounds that she hadn't proven the paper acted maliciously. So she was literally in a lose-lose situation. If she lost, she lost. If she won, she lost. Something required in libel suits involving public figures. Asked about the verdict as she left Manhattan Courthouse, Palin said, of course we're disappointed, adding that she hoped there would be an appeal. She also praised her two lawyers. Here it is. There were three of us versus the monstrous team of the New York Times. This is what she called them. Ballard Spar, the, the firm currently representing Amber Heard, is quoted as, by Sarah Palin herself as being a monstrous team. So they're vicious. They're vicious, they're unforgiving, and Camille and Ben most definitely need to buckle up for uh, the long haul. This is going to be a battle of wits in a very serious one, I expect. And she did, and we did well, excuse me, Sarah Palin goes on, doing all they can to make sure the little guy has a voice, the underdog can have their say. In a statement, the Times called the verdict a reaffirmation of a fundamental tenet of American law. Public figures should not be permitted to use libel suits to punish or intimidate news organizations that make acknowledge and swiftly correct unintentional errors. Now, see, that case was completely different, though. You have to remember, that case was completely different. They took measures to correct their error. The error was unintentional, and they are an organization. Like, none of this is present in our case of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. In our case, we have two public figures that are individuals, not news organizations, one of them using a medium, the Washington Post, and then followed by Twitter to publish and republish an article without naming Johnny by name, but alluding to him and obviously testifying later in court. Like, it doesn't even matter what who allegedly the op-ed was about she testified that he allegedly did all these physical things to her which he denied and the jury believed johnny over amber that these things never happened um and published about it published an article about it that almost destroyed a man's career for the rest of his life luckily it was only stymied it was only slowed down for about four or five years but that's millions and millions and millions of dollars and uh, a, a damage to reputation that Johnny Depp has suffered as a result of her action. Completely different. You cannot say it's a fundamental tenet of American law that public figures are permitted to speak falsity and destroy a person's reputation based on false statements. That will never, ever be a lawful, legally binding law in the United States of America. The day that happens, the whole precept of decency and American culture will collapse because anybody will be able to say anything about anyone at any point without consequence. And that's it. That's, that's, that's it. Society will literally go to shit at that point. Luckily, we still have the ability to not have someone else defame us, right? Either by libel or slander. Libel is written, slander is uh, spoken. Speaking falsities about who we are, what we have done as people, right? So um, Palin, in her case, a former Republican vice presidential nominee, she sued the New York Times in 2017, claiming it had damaged her career. This is back when she was running for president, the 2016 presidency. It had damaged her career as a political commentator and a consultant with an editorial about gun control published after a man opened fire in a congressional baseball team practice in Washington, right? So 
she was tied to this. They retracted it. They said we made a mistake. That's the firm that represented um, Palin. This is it. And Mr. Axelrod was on the team. Okay, so let's go back to Mr. Axelrod. Mr. Axelrod um, was the representative on Palin versus New York Times, not Mr. Brown. So it looks like Mr. Axelrod in his career is having a sort of a shift. Uh, he went from being purely SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, uh, started in prosecution, went to the defense, and now he's doing more like public cases, helping out with the First Amendment uh, branch of Ballard Spar. Uh, Palin versus the New York Times company, he was the lead trial lawyer in successfully defending the Times against the libel suit brought by former Alaska governor and vice, pres vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin, in which the judge granted the defense motion to dismiss following trial testimony, but let the jury deliberate, resulting in a verdict that the Times was not liable. I wouldn't call this a big victory. No offense, but like they retracted the statement. It was an accident. They didn't mean to. It's not difficult. You know, I say that in quotes. It's a lot easier to win a case like that than it is the case that we have, right? Um, it, it's a very, very unique case because you have abuse on the table, uh, alleged abuse on one side and clear abuse on the other. And you, <laughs> you know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, it's not the same. It's not the same. Because look at the next case that he has done. Uh, NASDAQ versus the exchange trader managers. This is his repertoire, right? Th he's only done one defamation case. This is why it's an, a uh, by the way, it's an, uh, an also, right? He's been the lead trial lawyer in the securities contract dispute that resulted in a judgment in favor of a client of more than $80 million. Uh, he was also representing a CEO of a pharmaceutical startup in cases brought by the DOJ and SEC. Excuse me, this is a criminal case. United States versus Herbert Vaderman. Again, public integrity section of the DOJ, United States. Again, it's RICO, uh, representing a CFO, SEC, SEC, DOJ, SEC, security, not, uh, negotiated non-fraud settlement, um, SEC, right? SEC, 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 literally, it's littered with SEC, FINRA, SEC, all right? This is where this guy comes from. Um, representing matters at the Securities and Exchange Commission. Again, nothing but SEC versus when he was a prosecutor for the SEC. That's all he did. That's all he did. Um, and then back at the attorney's office, before that, he was doing criminal stuff and civil stuff. You know, Ponzi scheme here, mortgage lender, bank president, uh, prosecuted them, right? Um, even in his accolades by Chambers USA, Litigation, white collar crime, governor, government investigations, defense, SEC stuff. So you get the idea. He's been a speaker in a lot of those. That's his forte. He even authored some publications, securities fraud, just two years ago, barely two years ago. Uh, he's a Harvard grad. Whoop de doo. You know, whatever that means. Um, uh, Harvard Law School. So he's been practicing just shy 10 years of Mr. Brown. So about almost 20 years he's been in practice. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so that's, that's David and Mr. Brown, right? Now let's look at the firm itself because it, it, it has some information on not just uh, these two individuals, but it also has some information about what they do. Like, why should you hire us, right? And they have this page right here. I'm going to make this uh, a little bit bigger so you all can see because it's kind of tiny, I think, on your screens. Uh, is that better? That looks better. Okay. Uh, media and Entertainment, Ballard Spar. Ballard Spar, Spar's Media and Entertainment Law Group is the premier practice of its kind in the country. All right, there you go. It's in the name. This is how they advertise themselves. Remember I told you, these guys are not a joke. These guys are a force to be reckoned with. Amber knows what she's doing. She's been told who she needs to speak with. She has spoken to the best, 
and she has now officially hired the best. Our attorneys have played a central role in many of the most significant First Amendment cases in recent years for the most prominent U.S. news organizations, as well as for individual citizens and public interest organizations. Our media lawyers help clients across platforms navigate some of the most challenging legal issues that arise in a healthy functioning democracy in the news and in court. Our clients range from global news, entertainment, and advertising companies to local newspapers, news startups, freelance journalists, and internet companies. We also represent studios, directors, and producers, sports teams, universities, authors, filmmakers, nonprofits, and government watchdog organizations, anyone who creates or disseminates content. Our media lawyers, including several who are former journalists, have won jury verdicts defending leading media companies in high-stakes defamation trials. Hint, hint, Sarah Palin versus New York Times. They have successfully defended clients in thorny First Amendment cases, prevailing on pretrial motions, and defending those judgments on appeal, including all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Our work helping journalists gain access to important proceedings and records through the Freedom of Information Act and other laws routinely helps the press inform the public about significant issues. In fact, over the years, our lawyers have secured access to court records and government documents that have made national and international headlines. Our team works on a daily basis with newsrooms providing 24-7 pre-publication and pre-broadcast review and counseling. So basically, if you are about to do something that you might think might be defamatory, send it to us. We'll charge you an arm and a leg and we'll review it and let you know if this is good, right? I, would, I don't know. That seems a little sketchy, but whatever. The Media and Entertainment Law Group has entered numerous, uh, earned, excuse me, numerous accolades, including as National Law Firm of the Year for First Amendment litigation from U.S. News and World Report's best lawyers three of the past five years. And this is what they do. Counsel across editorial and business issues. They say, we provide counseling and litigation services related to defamation, invasion of privacy, and content-based claims, access to government records, blah, 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 blah. This is really what we care about. And it's literally first on their list. Defamation, right? Our attorneys are at the forefront of advising clients about legal issues surrounding the latest technology for gathering and publishing news and information. We counsel media companies on news gathering issues and work closely with colleagues in our nationally recognized intellectual property department to protect our clients' rights in their content, copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Backed by outstanding Ballard Spar practices across disciplines, we advise leading media and entertainment clients on antitrust and unfair competition, securities litigation, reorganization and restructuring, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Ballard Spar media lawyers are based in our offices across the country, including media hubs such as New York, D.C., and L.A. We have expanded our powerhouse media and entertainment practice in recent years through mergers with Levine, Sullivan, Coach, and Schultz, formerly the preeminent First Amendment litigation and media law boutique in the United States in 2017, and with a prominent group of entertainment lawyers from the Leopard, Petrich, and Smith firm in L.A. in 2019. Okay. Uh, and of course, right at the top here, they have David Axelrod and the media team secure trial victory in Palin versus New York Times. Now, they also protected the First Amendment. The story, by the way, uh, is Derek Chauvin. Remember him? The guy who shot and killed George Floyd in Minneapolis. Now, this is an interesting one. The trial of Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who was convicted in the murder of George Floyd, was the first Minnesota criminal trial to be broadcast live on television. That almost didn't happen, but for this, these lawyers' uh, work. The case was the focus of intense international scrutiny, but with the deadly coronavirus pandemic raging, the court imposed a near total prohibition on in-person attendance. In Minnesota, cameras are allowed in court only if all parties consent, and the state prosecutors refused. They said no, no cameras. Over the objection of the prosecutors, the court declared the only way to have an open trial was to live stream it. The prosecutors then filed a motion for reconsideration, urging the judge to reverse course. 
Lita Walker, a Minneapolis-based First Amendment litigator and partner, see, this is where they come in, in Ballard Spar's media and entertainment law group, represented a coalition of news and organizations that demanded access. The coalition included the Star Tribune, Minnesota Public Radio, the Associated Press, CBS, Court TV, CNN, New York Times, and others. Assisted by Emmy Parsons, an associate in the firm's media practice, Ms. Walker filed a brief in support of the judge's initial order to allow gavel-to-gavel -gavel video coverage. The proposal that is extremely high profile, an important trial should occur largely behind closed doors, was not an idea our media clients were eager to accept, Ms. Walker later wrote. But, she continued, they recognized the trade-offs. They could push for in-person access for just a few journalists, or they could find a way to let the world to watch. The May 25th, 2020 slaying captured on video sparked a series of protests across the United States, as you all remember. Officer Chauvin knelt on Mr. Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes as Mr. Floyd unarmed and handcuffed gas, I can't breathe, the famous phrase, numerous times before he died. His death unleashed an international outpouring of grief and anger over law enforcement treatment of black men and women in America. This is the firm. This is the firm. This is who she hired, Amber Heard. It wasn't the first time Ms. Walker went to bat for the press to access information in the trial of a police officer. In 2019, she won media access to body camera footage in the trial of Minneapolis. Officer Mohamed Noor later found guilty in the killing of an unarmed Justine Rajik Damond. In the Chauvin case, Ms. Walker argued that if the court was going to close the courtroom because of the extraordinary circumstances brought on by the pandemic, this is the key right here. The First Amendment required expansive remote coverage. You can't just close doors. This trial is too big. It has to be public, Your Honor, and here's why. And the U.S. Supreme Court previously had made clear that trial courts, quote, are obligated to take every reasonable measure to accommodate public attendance and criminal trials. This firm, Ballard Spar, was involved. Not our protagonists. Notice that the, it's Ms. Walker and Ms. Parsons were the ones directly involved in this particular case with the trial of Derek Chauvin. They didn't represent either side. They were simply arguing First Amendment precepts and how important they are to keep the trial open to the public. See, there's a common theme here. We have you know, uh, Sarah Palin. We have uh, keeping the courts open. First Amendment issues. Bottom line. Bottom line. Ms. Walker again succeeded on behalf of her media clients. The media coalition's brief was accepted by the judge who denied the prosecutor's motion for reconsideration. Basically, the trial was public with the court TV cameras rolling. The trial was live streamed and broadcast on numerous outlets as millions of viewers worldwide followed proceedings. Well, wow. Now what? Let's talk about our case. Um, I'm just checking if there are any super chats. Uh, I don't think there were any. I didn't see any. So I don't have to. Okay. No questions. If you guys have questions, feel free. Um, what about our case? Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. In order for us to answer that, we need to go back to the verdict. We need to go back to the verdict. The verdict Johnny on all three claims, if you all remember. And it was in favor of Amber on one of the claims. Here it is. So let's tie these two together. Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Heard. Special verdict form. You guys remember this? Let me make it bigger. It's probably a little small.
All right, that looks a lot better. Mr. Depp's claim against Ms. Hurd. The special, this special verdict form includes each of the statements on which Mr. John C. Depp II bases his claim of defamation against Amber Hurd. Excuse me, please answer the questions in accordance with the court's instructions. Number one, uh, is this the first one? I just want to make sure. I think so. Yes. Number one, as to the statement appearing in the online op-ed entitled Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. This has to change in the Washington Post's online edition. The first statement, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all elements of defamation? Yes or no? And the answer was yes, as to this particular statement. If you answered yes, please answer yes or no to the following questions. Was it made or published by Ms. Hurd? Yes. Statement about Mr. Depp? Yes. Was it false? Yes. Defamatory? Yes. Defamation designed and intended by Ms. Hurd? Yes. Did the circumstances surrounding the publication, it conveyed defamatory implications to someone who is other than Mr. Depp? Yes. If you answered all, do you find that Mr. Depp has proven by clear and convincing evidence that Ms. Hurd acted with actual malice? The answer is yes. And it went on. We're not going to go through every single one of them. I just wanted to, to set the stage first, right? So they said yes, yes, yes on, on everything. They said damages, 10 million, 5 million. We know all of this. We know all of this. But now here's the question. How is Amber planning on winning her appeal? And there's only one answer to that. And we already know what it is on First Amendment grounds. What does that mean? What is the First Amendment? The First Amendment simply allows an individual to use free speech and or truth as an absolute defense to defamation. That's the bottom line. Defamation has several elements. If you all remember, you all remember what the elements of defamation are? They all have to be proven. It's got to be a false statement purporting to be fact, publication of that statement. It amounts to at least negligence. In our case, you require also malice and damages. That's it. If you can prove through this is what I suspect is going to be um, her lawyer's argument that the statement, she can't say it wasn't published, right? She can't say he didn't suffer damages. The only two things that she can cling on to is she say there was no malice and it's basically my free speech to allow me to say these things about Johnny because they did happen. That's her argument, which we all know is bullshit. But appeals don't work like jury trials. On appeal, you don't have a jury of 12 or 6 or 7 or 9 to be deciding your case anymore. On appeal, you get to argue your case to judges with pieces of paper called briefs that her lawyers are now going to be filing, right? That Ballard Spar is now going to be filing on her behalf. This is what this appeal is going to look like. She can only argue that either one, my statement was true, and I have a right to say it, or two, she can say that there was no malice. Those are really the only two issues she has any hope of potentially trying to win on. To lawyer skills, how well does each side understand First Amendment principles and how well does each side, how well is each side able to argue First Amendment principles to the Supreme, uh, to the Court of Appeals, excuse me, of Virginia first, and then possibly uh, Supreme Court of Virginia, and then possibly United States Supreme Court. I don't know how far this is going to go. I don't know how much money Amber Heard has in her pocket and how much more she can generate because lawyers are expensive, especially the top 
lawyers in the country for First Amendment claims. I don't blame her for canning Elaine today. I really don't. Elaine is not a First Amendment lawyer. She can barely use the First Amendment in the courtroom, for God's sake. How do you expect her to litigate First Amendment claims in, uh, in the Court of Appeals? The games are over. Amber Heard is saying, let's bring on the cannons. I'm, I'm putting down my, my katana and my pistol, and I'm bringing a bazooka. That's what Amber is doing right now. She brought a fucking bazooka to the fight. Um, it's not going to be easy. Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez need to prepare themselves for the First Amendment battle, the biggest battle, uh, biggest First Amendment battle this country has ever seen. No question. Um, I believe that this is going to change history once again. It has already changed history inside the courtroom in Fairfax, Virginia. And now this case is going to change history once again as we're going to have appellate courts creating law. This is how law is created. One of the ways you know you can have the legislature pass laws. This is going to be judicially made law about the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. I don't know what their argument is going to be. I honestly have no idea because it is, is going to have to come from left field. And I can't wait until those briefs come out and I will have a chance to read them with you all and analyze them, uh, which will be a, a few months from now. Uh, I don't know what the deadline is, but I feel that it is going to be uh, unprecedented. They're going to they're have to argue. Either it's going to be as basic. Like I have two thoughts in my head. Either they're going to argue something so asinine and crazy and hoping that it will work. Or they're just going to go, you know, treading the same paths that have already been beaten uh, uh, by First Amendment litigators uh, before them, which is, again, and truth is an absolute defense. Um, they're, the jury has basically they're going to say the jury's got it wrong. Amber has testified to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, X, Y, Z, you know, this list of things. And they're going to say that the jury simply did not understand. They got it wrong. And Amber was speaking the truth, and because what she said was the truth, the resulting uh, conclusion should be the uh, uh, appeal should be overturned, sent back to the trial court. We need a new jury. Start the process over. Okay, that's option one, uh, or I guess option two. Option one is to argue something that I can't even fathom what they could possibly come up with. They are the best First Amendment uh, firm in the country. So I'm not surprised that I can't come up with their with their appeal strategy since it's not something that I regularly practice in. Um, but I'm looking forward to analyzing it because once it's on paper, that's going to be a whole different ballgame. It, it's going to be up for scrutiny, for analysis, for interpretation, for understanding, for you know dissecting and analyzing and talking about. And I think it's going to be really, really fun. I really do. Um, as a lawyer, I think it's going to be really, really fun as a citizen uh, who is hoping, you know, was hoping that Johnny Depp will finally have won and call it a day. I am devastated. I am absolutely devastated because now, how should I put this? Shit just got real. Shit just got real. You guys. Because if even if the argument is bad, even if the argument is bad by Ballard Spar on behalf of Amber Heard, but the plaintiff's attorneys like Camille and Ben and whoever else they bring on don't have sufficient ammunition and legal argument to counter Spar. They could win. That's the danger. D Welcome to the legal profession where facts sometimes are overlooked in favor of protecting precepts of the law. First Amendment principles. This is what Amber has always said since she started the case since she lost her trial. She has said the same thing over and over. First, this is my First Amendment right to do this, right? 
it and everybody was like okay that nobody fucking cares lady like you lied we caught you in a lie we saw what you did we heard what you said we don't believe you go home right you lost and now she goes i lost on the facts let me try to win on the law a new stage is set a new set of rules is applied and a brand new battle is about to wage on in the appellate level. This is no joke, you guys. I cannot sugarcoat this. As much as I would love to sit here and be like, oh, what is she doing? This is all bullshit. She's just wasting her money and she's going to lose. And that, that. I can't. I can't in good conscience, in good faith, sit here with a straight face and say those things. This has gotten real. Uh, and I'm looking forward to arguments from both sides because this is going to be, like I said, this is going to be a historic national First Amendment battle. Um, all Amber's team, I'm sorry, all Johnny's team has to do is to stick to their guns, not fall into the fluff that uh, Ballard Spar is going to be putting forward and focus on the main objective that the statements that she made were false, that they have been proven to be false. The trial court has followed all the proper procedure. There was no, uh, there were no exhibits that would have rescued Amber's claim from the ashes. I mean, everything that her team has, uh, his team has to do needs to do. And if they do it, they have a chance at beating this, killing it and, and calling it a day. Now, like I said, I don't know how much money Amber has, uh, this case, if it goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court, this case will be over in 2027, 2026, 2027. That's assuming it goes all the way and they accept certiorari, which the United States Supreme Court is one of the most unique courts in the country. You can actually look at a case and go, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not doing this. We're not analyzing this. Um, but uh, if it does, and if it accepts certiorari, first it has to get there, right? So we're done with the trial court. We're going to the Virginia Court of Appeals. After that, we're going to the Virginia Supreme Court, presumably, if whichever side loses, they're going to take it. And then you can go to the United States Supreme Court. And if they accept certiorari under a decision, we could potentially have a case that will have a decision like December 2027. Like, I'm, that's just the way these courts work. They, they take for fucking ever. Um, so... Yeah, um, she's not a news outlet. She can't win on a lie. You know, that's that's one of the arguments um, for sure. Lie to defame, not in my country. Watch. Again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a plea on emotion right now. I completely understand where you're coming from. Amber is throwing a Hail Mary, no question about it. Here's a contribution to the upcoming coffee fund. You'll need it. Thanks, Kat. Um, all right, you guys. Um, I really appreciate you joining me. It's been fun informing you. Oh, here's a, there's one last minute one. She is unconvincing as a human being. There's a difference between the truth and the actual truth. New lawyers was the only move left for her team. And I agree. I agree. You remember, like I said, there are two ways to win a case. I, I tell my, cl my clients this every single day of my practice. There are two ways to win a case. You can win on the facts or you can win on the law. Or you can lose on both. You can even win on both. But clearly in this case, she has lost on the facts. The jury did not believe her. They believed Johnny. She lost. No question. That's over. On appeal, now she has a chance to argue the law. Is that enough to overturn a verdict? Time will tell. Thank you all for joining me on this lovely Monday afternoon. Uh, I'm going to keep my eyes on this. I mean, obviously, over the next few months, we're going to have more stuff coming through. So uh, stay in tuned. If you don't, uh, if you haven't yet, don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel. Uh, and I will be providing, of course, some of my own content and, of course, following this uh, as closely as I can. And I, I'm very much looking for far is capable of what their arguments are going to be. And I think uh, we're in it to win it, you guys. This is going to be big. This is going to be big. I will see you all later. I love every single one of you. Peace out.